Okay, so thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm Takuya Kasai. Uh, I'm a moderator for this session today. I'd like to briefly introduce you know, my career histories. I've been in uh, over 20 years in renewable energy space in North America and Asia Pacific. This mission, my, uh, this is my mission to make an, a greener economy for the best interests of our children and the prosperity in this lifetime. Currently, I'm a head of APAC and for NLX Advisory Services, a decarbonization consulting firm uh, with over 420 consultants across the globe under the uh, Italian utility of NL. And I support all decarbonization from large scale and uh, uh, global commercial industrial companies to small and medium enterprise, so-called SME, as you know, uh, across APAC. As you know, um, uh, while uh, many global companies are promoting a decarbonization in the first place, and there's a still a long way to go for SME. And today, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to discuss innovative business model and a financial mechanism to support the decarbonization of SMEs and across APAC. So first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Eva Kelly Obrander. Eva is a, a chief executive officer at the Renewable Energy and the Energy Efficiency Partnership, so-called uh, REAP develop innovative and efficient financing mechanism to advance the market readiness for clean energy service in low and medium income countries. She's an expert in renewable energy financing and a climate uh, uh, change policy with a deep understanding and a proven industry experience within the clean energy sectors. In her over 15 years with REAP, and uh, she has taken a variety of executive and a strategic role and uh, been integrated in driving for the REAP's emissions to avoid uh, advanced market readiness for clean energy service in low and medium income countries. Ever is a, a management team on the private and a financing advisory network, so-called PFAN. Before joining REAP, you know, Ever worked in Australia for the Clean Energy Council and the Federal Department of Environment. Having worked in the private and non-governmental and uh, government sectors, Ever has wealth knowledge about uh, the various needs and agenda for of each of these sectors. She holds a degree in economics, uh, linguistic, and uh, environment policy. Welcome, uh, please welcome Ever Kelly of Renders. Um, thank you for the introduction, Tuck. And um, before I begin, I'd like to uh, congratulate ADB and the partners for uh, pulling off another fantastic event. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to coordinate uh, such a big event. So congratulations to ADB and your partners um, on doing this. I will make my remarks from here. Uh, you know, I'm very significantly vertically challenged and the lanterns are not very friendly to me. And this way I have a much better connection to you all from here. We live um, in fantastic times today. Um, those of us who've been in the sector for 20 years, uh, we have seen the investment into clean energy uh, increase tenfold in the last 20 years. Are we doing enough to stop temperature rising beyond critical levels? Of course not. But we are seeing unprecedented amount of funding going into clean energy and climate more broadly and that needs to be celebrated. This includes the access to energy sector. Bankable solutions have been developed. There are businesses in the sector that are successfully delivering uh, clean energy services to people in the rural areas. These are fintech companies, clean tech companies, energy service companies, and they're doing this successfully. Of course, the sector relies on a lot of public support. But our colleagues uh, from IRENA that are going to be making a presentation after me is going to show that the investment into decentralized renewable energy sector has grown uh, significantly and consistently over the 10 years. However, the most vulnerable populations are still being left behind. And this includes populations that are relying on agriculture as their source of livelihood. 
and yet productive use of energy offers opportunity to lock in low greenhouse gas development pathways, improve lives and livelihoods, and build resilience against future shocks, such as the triple finance, energy, and food crisis that we have seen over the last couple of years. With recent developments in the international financial markets, the cost of borrowing for companies has become very high. And at the same time, liquidity in small and medium enterprises is very low. To be honest, it's very difficult to predict how SMEs are going to deal with this in the next couple of years. And at the same time, the supply in the agricultural value chains has tightened, the prices have increased, all of this due to the crisis that we have seen in the last couple of years. As well as facing the price increase on important foodstuff, the domestic yields are under threat as a result of climate change. And all of this at the time where populations are rising and therefore the demand for food is rising as well. If we look at the agri-food value chains, these present a range of activities that are required to bring agricultural produce across all the phases from on-farm production to storage to post-farm gate processing, as well as distribution and delivery to the consumers. Most of the energy that is required along these value chains is still supplied by manual labor. And where motorization is available or electric appliances are available, these are powered by fossil fuels or are in relying on unreliable grids. So the opportunity for clean energy here is immense. Standing in the way of these opportunities for productive use of renewables in agri-food value chains are challenges across all the levels, in the public sector, in the private sector, as well as in the consumers. We at REAP have done a lot of work in understanding what these challenges are, but in summary, there are threefold. Number one, scanned knowledge of the opportunities that are available. Number two, nascent or early stage markets for distribution. And number three, lack of local financing solutions. There are other issues such as business environment being volatile, lack of coherent policy, market information to actually build the business models non-existent, etc. The good news, there are a number of good models available and some of them have been in place for some time. These include community-based renewable energy models such as smart agricultural villages, on-farm renewable energy production, energy crop production, biogas production, et cetera. And there are new clean energy solutions that have emerged proving that off-grid renewable energy technologies can be effective in these settings, contributing to increased food production and avoiding food loss and waste. So on that good note, back to TAC, and we're looking forward to our other presenters to talk about the challenges they have encountered along their agricultural value chains in their countries and the solutions they're seeing emerging. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva. It was very fruitful uh, topics. And Eva and our speaker come from uh, various company, uh, countries and uh, such as Thai, India, and Cambodia, uh, and Indonesia, and also myself in Japan within APAC. So let's talk about the challenges they, uh, they have encountered in their country, along with the uh, agree food, the body change, and the solution they have uh, emerging. So thank you so much. So next, uh, uh, next speaker, and uh, Farhan Arana is an associate program officer at the International Renewable Energy Agency, so-called uh, ARENA. Uh, where she analyzed uh, the energy transition related investment, focusing in particular on renewable, including in the off-grid sector. 
Previously, he worked on uh, ANSAT ACAP and regional office in, in Bangkok and as an energy access and analysis. Please welcome uh, Alan Rana. Thanks a lot, Tuck, and uh, thanks, Eva, for providing that overview. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be here with you all uh, at the Asia Clean Energy Forum uh, in person. Um, so I work for the International Renewable Energy Agency, and I'm very excited to present to you Irina's report on the global landscape of renewable energy finance. So the report really looks at some uh, macro level trends in the renewable energy sector uh, investments and really comes from a broad macro perspective. So as I share some of these insights with you, uh, I also very much look forward to the discussions in this panel and over the next few days uh, to see how this macro story uh, connects with uh, some of the stuff that is happening on the ground. So just to back up a bit, I wanted to discuss the overall global picture of renewable energy investments and then talk a bit more about the off-grid and productive use uh, sectors. So before I do, just a brief introduction about IRENA, uh, for those who may not know, uh, we are an intergovernmental organization with more than uh, 160 member states uh, with the mandate to promote the widespread adoption and sustainable use of all forms of renewable energy. Uh, we so, so we primar pri primarily support our member states through uh, policy advice, through data and statistics, uh, capacity building, project facilitation, uh, as well as knowledge products and analytical work. Uh, so this report sits within our knowledge product uh, work, uh, focusing specifically on uh, renewable energy financing. So in line with the theme of this session and the previous session in this room, uh, which is innovative and resilient renewable energy, uh, the story I discussed today is indeed of resilience. Um, in the last two years or three years, uh, the renewable energy sector, together with the world economy, has faced a number of headwinds in the form of uh, macroeconomic certainty, uncertainty, uh, supply chain disruptions, and rising geopolitical tensions. Uh, but thanks to continued policy support and the existing momentum behind renewables, investments have continued to grow. And in 2022, they reached a record high of half a trillion US dollars. Now, most of these uh, investments are, of course, led by solar PV and onshore wind. Um, but as we will see, Investments are increasingly concentrated in China, US, and Western Europe, so a handful of advanced economies. And next slide, please. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, in fact, um, from our analysis, we see that least developed countries attracted less than 1% of global investments since 2013. And it's staggering to see that more than half of the world's population, uh, primarily residing in developing and emerging economies, uh, received just 15% of global investments. So disparities in investments continue to grow. And as far as a just and inclusive energy transition is concerned, I think there is a long way to go. However, we must take note of the tremendous progress that's been made in the Asia Pacific region, um, where disparities in investment per capita are in fact shrinking when you compare this region uh, to Europe or North America. However, some disparities, as I said, continue to exist and there's more work that needs to be done. But the progress is of course commendable. And in Asia Pacific, uh, next slide, please. And this is because countries in this region have really been the center stage for uh, financial creativity and ambitious policy making. There's a growing pipeline of projects in Asia and the Pacific. And in addition to China and India, ASEAN is really paving the way forward. Countries here have set ambitious targets and have enacted policy mechanisms such as feed-in tariffs and auctions that are driving deployment and attracting more and more private sector investment. Uh, Vietnam's recent experience is of particular note. Uh, the country has seen immense growth in renewable energy investments over the last few years, uh, primarily incentivized through feed-in tariffs and auctions, 
And in the last three or four years, it's risen through the ranks and actually now accounts for about half of the region's investments, which stands at 80 billion since 2010. Now, so far, I've been talking about the uh, overall renewable energy sector, but I would like to shift focus to the decentralized renewable space. And just to provide a bit of context, um, in 2022, developing countries attracted about 75 billion in, in investments for renewable energy. Uh, whereas the decentralized renewable space uh, attracted 4 billion in the last 10 years. So given some of these figures, this sector is really a microcosm of the overall financing landscape. But its impact is immense. More than 200 million people have gained access to electricity from decentralized renewable solutions. And that's a very high return on investment, especially when you consider the socioeconomic benefits associated with providing access to these populations. Now, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, a lot of this progress was threatened. Uh, we had supply chain disruptions, as I mentioned, which led to an increase in manufacturing and distribution costs. Um, real household incomes shrank, and we heard uh, cases of customers defaulting on their bills uh, under the pay-as-you-go model. Um, and we saw that companies had to find new ways of securing working capital because a lot of their assets were tied up as receivables. So given these challenges, investments declined in 2020, despite the growth that we've seen since the beginning of uh, the previous decade. However, um, thanks to strong investment growth in Africa and the support from DFIs, uh, investments bounced back in 2021 and reached a record high level of more than 500 million. In addition to that, we also see some market consolidation in the sector. Investments are of course growing, but these are mainly led by a few large companies that have a strong market position and are able to attract large uh, investments. Whereas financing for uh, smaller enterprises, for startups has become increasingly more difficult in the current economic climate. All that aside, uh, we see that current investments are far short of the 15 billion needed annually uh, until 2030 to reach universal access to energy. Now, majority of these investments uh, continue to go to solar home systems, mainly for residential use, but we see some positive uh, trends in the micro and mini grid space, uh, which are increasingly attracting more investments, uh, serving more commercial and industrial users. Uh, we see that companies are increasingly diversifying uh, across multiple uh, products and multiple market segments. And here we see that uh, the share going to commercial and industrial applications has uh, tripled from between 2015 and 2021. And together with productive uses, CNI applications are helping promote local economies, creating jobs and economic growth while enhancing food security and resilience. And that goes to show that the discourse around energy access has changed. For many households, electricity connections alone are not enough. The pathway out of poverty is gainful employment through income generating activities and productive uses, complemented by long-term human capital development. Next slide, please. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, we've seen a story of resilience and record high investments, uh, but also a story of concentration. As mentioned, few advanced economies take in majority of the investments, and these are uh, economies where uh, private capital is more, um, the env environment is more conducive to private capital because these uh, economies offer favorable risk return profiles. While in a lot of other contexts, private money does not flow or if it flows, it flows so at a much higher cost. So in those contexts, public financing needs to play a much larger role. However, in the current economic climate with countries fiscal capacity constrained, as they grapple with high inflation and currency depreciations, the international community needs to play a much larger role. Multilateral and bilateral DFIs provided around 3% of total renewable energy investments in 2020. But the portion of grants and concessional loans among this is even lower. 
even the just energy transition programs, um, the one in South Africa and in Indonesia, mainly provide loans at market rates with very few grants. So the just element within these programs still needs to be you know, figured out. So in line of all these um, uh, facts, sorry, previous slide. We ask the international community to step up their efforts. DFIs, development banks, government donors, and global funds such as the GCF and the Loss and Damage Fund must step up their support and mobilize more, more funds in the form of concessional loans and grants, especially in countries that struggle to attract investments. And these investments at the same time um, need to provide dedicated support for the off-grid and productive and use sector to build and sustain resilient livelihoods. I'll end my presentation here and happy to take any more questions uh, later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, next speaker, uh, Sonita Chin, is a startup program manager of uh, Energy Lab Cambodia. She has been working on uh, uh, to nature the startup using a solar technology solution for agri-fishery sector through the incubation and acceleration program. With a mon uh, mandate to promote a clean energy market in Cambodia, Energy, uh, uh, Energy Lab also tap on supporting an innovative ca Cambodian startup, farmers and SME to go clean while uh, increasing their revenues. Please welcome Sonita Chin. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Tao mentioned, I am Sonita from Cambodia. I'm working for Energy Lab Cambodia. So I uh, would like to share with you all about the Clean Energy Startup Acceleration program that Energy Lab has been running in Cambodia. Okay, so before moving into the program in details, I also like to um, introduce about Energy Lab Cambodia as well, um, in case um, the room uh, haven't heard about us. So Energy Lab Cambodia um, established in the end of 2018 in Cambodia, and we work to support the growth of clean energy market in Cambodia through many um, kind of work by initiate and guide a clean energy policy. We work with um, private sector, government sector, development partner through various activities. Uh, we facilitate uh, the collaboration between them to have discussion about the sector and also we nurture the startup, which I'm going to present in detail later. And we have a few others kind of program that raise awareness about a clean energy sector in Cambodia, such as internship, fellowship program, and also our flagship event called Clean Energy Week that we do every year to promote the opportunities that clean energy uh, bring to Cambodia. Okay, so uh, now moving on to the topic regarding our acceleration program. So basically our acceleration program is focusing on nurturing the startups that are using solar technology to solve this, um, different like problems in agriculture sector. So why we initiated this program? Because we've seen a few constraints in the agriculture sector that solar technology can solve it. So firstly, the reliability and the cost of electricity. In Cambodia, there are still like approximately 200 villages that still have no access to electric city. And most of the Cambodian are rely on agriculture as a source of income. So without the reliability and the high cost, uh, the high tariff of electric city is um, stopping the growth of the, the sector. And secondly, it's the access to the technology and machinery. So um, in Cambodia, we still lack of different technologies and machinery for the farmers to really apply into their um, agriculture practice. Also, we have no reliable cold chain system as well. 
So there is no, um, not many existing startups like to respond to those um, issues at all. That's why we initiated this acceleration program to have build up the startups that come up with different solutions that can help solving all these issues. So how our program works, um, we run it in a four different phase. Firstly, hackathon, which is a weekend, hack, uh, weekend, a weekend dedicated that um, we invited those who are interested in this sector to learn more about the challenges in the agriculture and what kind of like opportunities in solar technology they can produce, they can build in order to help the farmers in Cambodia. After the hackathon, those who are interested, um, they are moving on to our pre-incubation, which is a six-week program that we allow them to start working more on their business idea and validate their idea with the farmers or doing some research. Moving on uh, from the pre-incubation, they're going to the incubation program, which is a one-year program that we support them um, more extensively to validate their business idea they're doing the prototype, so they start purchasing the product in order to testing. They find their early adopters to see how the system works. And lastly, they are moving into the acceleration program, which we support a little bit a later stage startup in order to scale up into the market. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I would like to um, bring a case study about the startups that we have been supporting. So uh, they're called Agree House. So they joined us in the incubation programs in 2019. And currently they're also particip participating in our acceleration program um, currently. So they started with us by having like three members and then they now they um, like enlarge their team into seven members and they start register their business in 2021. And so far they have been working with around 220 farmers. So through our support um, in the program, the team has developed a lot. Uh, initially in the incubation stage, they come to us by propose the business idea. Um, which is about the cricket. So they de developed the solar power cricket um, racing pens. And until now, they have developed um, several business pipelines which fo focusing on nutritive um, products, uh, which is focused on like cricket-based products such as uh, cricket snack, cricket powder, and also sunny snack. Now they are doing uh, pre pretty well by trying to export their cricket powder into um, the international market as well. So um, how our program works in more detail, our approach, we build those startups in three different stages. So firstly, for those who really don't have anything, they come to us and then we support them to build their business. They launch their minimum viable product and they go find the early adopter to test how the product works and get the feedback. After we support them to sell their product into the market by uh, supporting them in marketing, um, managing their finance, and lastly, um, moving into the growing stage where they can scale up, be, become investment ready and find investor. So throughout the program, we support them to um, work with the business development expert and also agriculture um, expert and solar market experts to help them like complement in all the component that they can actually start their business. So throughout the program as well, we don't just support them like in general with a fixed um, curriculum. We have like a specific mentoring sessions that they meet a ball to meet their mentor individually in order to discuss their specific um, issue based on the teams. Also, but our curriculum, we design really based on their needs. Um, we have like kind of a, 
a set curriculum in the first place. But when they join our program, we don't really follow that. We just study about their needs. We conduct the need assessment and see what um, they lack in their business development in terms of uh, solar technology expertise, uh, market agriculture, market knowledge, etc. Also, we also support them to create um, more exposure opportunities to uh, impact investors and funders. So uh, through our, our experience, even though the program has been um, proving that it's supporting the market like to build more startups and introducing more solar technologies into agriculture sector, but we have seen uh, some of the challenges as well. Firstly, solar technology, uh, solar market in Cambodia is still a small niche. Therefore, even though there are many people who are interested in it, they are still reluctant to really kick off anything because they lack of the technical expertise in this area. And there's also the uncertainty of their market side as well. So this kind of link into the second challenges, which is a lack of so financial support for the research and development as well the, the prototyping. So because of the lack of financial support in doing research and development, we have no um, like detailed information about how the land technology market size uh, in agriculture, in specific agriculture value chain in Cambodia yet. And another um, challenge is also the proof of concept and behavioral change in the solar market. So from our experience, our startups still are facing their difficulty in like en in encouraging their customer, the farmers to really adopt the technology because um, the farmers still think it's um, quite new to them and it's not yet reliable for them to use um, in their agricultural practices. As well as in the funding market, um, there are existing solar technology provider, which seems um, a little dominant um, from which make the new startups a bit a little bit challenged in order to like get out into the market, get the funding to scale up their ideas. Lastly, the value chain is still um, fragmented in Cambodia. So yes, this is my last slide. I have like 30 seconds. So the recommendation is that oh, there should be more investment in the market research so that um, they the startups or the private sector can see the opportunities on where they should invest on. And there should be more sensible and flexible funding approaches that allow the startups to really innovate and expand their business idea. And lastly, there should be more uh, facilitate um, between multi-stakeholders across the country, agriculture, solar technology to come together and find the solutions in making the sector growing better. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next speakers, Preeti uh, Kumari is a program associate with the energy program at the World Resource Institute India. She works toward increasing access to clean energy in intervention for like live, livelihood and through the research and the implementations. Preeti has over four years of experience in the decentralized renewable energy sectors in various capacities, and she's skilled in project management and demand assessment and research and business development of DRE-based interventions in agriculture and allied sectors. Please welcome yeah. Politi Kramari. Thank you, Dr. for the introduction. Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Preeti and I work uh, with WRI India in the Energy Access Program. WRI India Energy Access Program works across several pillars of energy access in the health, livelihood, education, and agriculture. Today I'm going to present some of our work in the livelihood sector, and I will be presenting an assessment of available financing and business models. Uh, for the deployment of decentralized renewable energy in the agri-food value chain. Next slide, please. 
Yeah. So in India, around 70% of the rural household depend on agriculture uh, for their sustenance. And out of which 86% are small and marginal farmers, which means that they cultivate uh, on a land holding of around one hectare, which is quite small and often fragmented. They usually cultivate a uh, two season crop and sometimes three season crops as well. And uh, they majorly rely on diesel fuel in order to meet uh, their farm machineries and in order to run their farm machinery. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, farming is an uh, essential uh, part of the Indian uh, agriculture and it contributes to around 17% uh, towards the GDP. And considering the importance of agriculture in the livelihood uh, sector, uh, we have focused on understanding what are the current challenges that is faced in the agri-food agri value chain and how can clean energy interventions uh, could play a role in mitigating them. So some of the challenges that we observed in the agri-food value chain uh, were, so around uh, 30 million farmers uh, in India depend on diesel fuel in order to to run their uh, uh, to run their uh, uh, pumps. Uh, so in order to meet their irrigation requirement, and why this is a challenge because uh, these pumps are not only operationally expensive to run because of the volatile uh, diesel fuel prices, but also there is a high recurring cost. There's a lot of maintenance as well as rental cost that is involved. And considering their monthly income of these smallholder farmers often deters them to kind of uh, grow and cultivate, especially in the third season. So most of the time what happens is smallholder farmers skip this third season, especially the summer season, because of the lack of uh, affordable irrigation. And thus that result in deficit irrigation and thus leading to uh, lower productivity and income from farming. Uh, yeah, apart from that, we also found that in agribusinesses uh, such as milling, there is a critical unmet need uh, to power these diesel mills uh, to run, especially for, say, oil seed pressing or for the uh, various uh, rice hulling activities. And most of the time, these uh, activities are basically uh, taken care of by the women uh, members of the households. And this also leads to their time poverty because they have to kind of uh, take their processing uh, food and all to the nearby villages and this takes a lot of time effort. Apart from that, uh, we also found that there are limited availability of cold storages at the farm level for storing the horticultural produce. So even if a cold storage is present, uh, that is majorly used for bulk storage. By bulk storage, I mean they are majorly used to store uh, commodities such as apples and potatoes. Thus, there is not much system available for storing horticulture produce. Uh, apart from that, the other challenge that is faced is of unreliable electricity and voltage fluctuation, thus making it difficult for these systems to run. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we, through our research, we are trying to, first of all, understand what all the energy requirements are there in the various food value chain, in the various steps of the food value chain. In the inputs, we have uh, considered our focus on uh, the irrigation aspect in the inputs. In the production, we are looking at the various post-harvest processing activities. And in the uh, storage, we are looking at the cold storage. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Yeah. So uh, decentralized renewable energy uh, has emerged as an alternative source of energy to not only uh, power the productive use of energy, but also to address the energy access issues, especially in the remote rural areas of India. So what are productive use energy uh, appliances? So PUE is basically uh, any energy enabled products, which could be either used as a plug-in or could run on a battery or solar PV. You can understand it in terms of say, uh, solar power cold storages or solar uh, powered irrigation systems. And evidences have shown that they can maximize the socioeconomic uh, benefits for the end users. And I would also like to bring this point here that India's uh, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy uh, in their recent policy framework uh, came with facilitating the adoption of uh, DRE-based solution for the livelihood. And this also kind of gives a lot of consideration on the importance of how DRE can kind of augment 
uh, not only the reduction in diesel fuel in the livelihood sector, but also augment the uh, grid supplies. Next slide, please. So through our research, we are uh, trying to understand what are the key barriers that are currently inhibiting the growth of the productive use energy products. And this is a work in progress. And uh, we try to kind of take the perspective for the three stakeholders that we identified in our research. So for the end users here, end users, I mean small and marginal farmers, technology enterprises and the lending institutions. So for end users, we found that there is uh, still lack of awareness of the various government policies and programs, uh, which could help them to say access and adopt the various PUV products. Apart from that, the high upfront cost of the DRE technologies often deters them to avail them. Apart from uh, that, there is also reluctance in the adoption of or moving towards a new technology. For the technology enterprises, uh, we felt that there is lack of financing options and limited availability in terms of term loans or the short term loans, which could help them to kind of mitigate these operational costs that they incur. And there is also lack of collateral so that they cannot also access the debts from the government, uh, sorry, the lending institution. Uh, and also, uh, most of the time, whenever a new innovator or a technology enterprise comes up, so they find the challenge of finding the right subset of the consumers who will be the right end users of their product. So that is also one of the challenge. So apart from that, uh, the lending institution, the challenges faced is in terms of lack of collateral with both uh, end users and the technology enterprises, which deters them to kind of provide the various grants or the funds. And uh, because of the lack of credit histories of the smallholder farmers and uh, their inability to provide any collateral, they cannot also again go for the lending institutions. So these were some of the financing challenges uh, that we found for the three uh, stakeholders. Next slide, please. Next, next. Yeah, so these are some of the uh, financial and business models that we uh, identified that are currently being used in order to deploy the productive use energy products. So in case of microfinance, it serves the smallholder farmers with uh, kind of no collateral, but here the interest rates are higher as compared to the banks. In case of guarantee funds for end users, here the NGO partners with MFIs or any banks to facilitate the loan. But again, the challenge is in terms of that there is low appetite for risk from the uh, financial institution perspective. In case of community uh, shared use, here the community kind of uh, puts the money in order to buy the PUE product, the ONM and everything is taken care of by the community. But in case if there is not much ownership from the community, the system becomes defunct after certain times of usage of these systems. In case of grant-based, uh, these are philanthropically funded interventions. And most of the current interventions on the ground in India, we have observed that is uh, mostly grant-based and philanthropically uh, backed. Apart from that, uh, pay-per-use business model is something we are kind of seeing uh, adoption among the community because here the end users don't have to pay anything towards the upfront cost, but only pay for the service. For example, they have to only pay for the per liter of water, which is dispersed to their field or the per kg of produce that is stored. Uh, in the last model that is rent and lease to own here, the end users have a choice uh, to purchase the product. They can pay a fixed monthly fee. But again, here, uh, the ownership uh, is a little bit uh, lacking in terms of the person who is leasing uh, the particular product. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Okay, so some of the findings uh, from our uh, research so far is that the irrigation as a service has kind of picked up by the community and uh, solar uh, powered uh, irrigation system is kind of a mature technology. Uh, one of the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of government push uh, for the solar pumps in India. There is standardization of products are there. There is benchmark cost that has been established as well as technology specifications are available. Uh, apart from that, uh, the least mature technology that we have uh, found is of agro-processing mills because uh, they don't fall directly under any government programs and subsidies. There is no standardization of equipment and utilization is also seasonal. However, uh, we are now kind of seeing an integrated approach where the solar pumps are integrated with the agro-processing mills. So whenever the solar pumps are not in use, uh, the agro-processing mills uh, can basically run on the same uh, photovoltaic. Apart from that, uh, in the cooling, uh, 
the one of the biggest challenge that we are uh, looking at is that there is very high capex uh, technology though cooling as a service picking up but still the utilization is low uh, because the farmers tend to sell the produce on the day of the harvest itself uh, next slide please so uh, lastly i would like to uh, conclude by saying that in order uh, for the productive use energy appliances uh, to uptake in the agriculture sector there is a requirement of coordination between various value chain actors uh, from those with the product those with the capital and those who are maintaining the various touch points with the farmers and this should encompass these four aspect uh, that is reliability accessibility affordability inclusivity and sustainability uh, in order to be scalable uh, thank you Okay, uh, next speakers uh, are from in Indonesia, uh, last person, uh, Didi Herning. Uh, Didi has uh, 15 years, uh, uh, over 15 years of professional experience gained in private and government and development sectors with over 10 years of small scale renewable energy initiative. Currently the, the demonstration project lead for UK Indonesian low carbon energy partnership program known as toward Indonesian low carbon energy transition, Mentari. He built an extensive experience in uh, project management, social and environmental management, skill development, knowledge management, and the gender and the inclusion in Indonesia and the Timor Leste. Uh, please welcome uh, this uh, Didi Hanning. Okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's good to be back again after a long period of on online session. Uh, my name is Devi Hanning as an introduction. Currently, I work for Mentari Projects. It's a UK and Indonesia partnership with the Minister of, between the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources and British Embassy in Jakarta. So um, this is a demonstration project by saying demonstration projects, it means that we have a single goal in mind when we started these projects, that we want to reform micro, uh, the approach of mini grid in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Um, the reason, oh, someone put this additional in here. Uh, yeah, so the, this is the Mentari projects. Um, we have four strands. We have policy, brokerage, demonstration projects and collaborating a network. Also, we mainstream gender and inclusion in all of the strand. The idea is, like I said before, we want to reform to a mini grid approach in Indonesia, which is mainly dri uh, driven by government grant. Um, and that means we need to uh, provide a successful case study and reform the tender specification and also the approach to community consultation and engagement to be able to deliver a successful and sustainable business model for mini grid in Indonesia. Next. I think this is an old uh, presentation, right? Uh, do we have another version of this presentation? Sorry. Um, I, I'm uh, the, the second presentation uh, presenter because a college of mine prepared the uh, original one. Uh, obviously, the presentation is not this one.
because uh, some trouble happens. So <laughs> uh, won't be long. So uh, wait in a few few more minutes, and now uh, we'll get started. So good. Almost there. There you go. We have a smart team right there, so it should be fine. All right. Uh, we still have some time, so so uh, wait uh, while waiting and uh, uh, it's coming. It's good. Okay, then. Shall we move to questions? It's good. Okay. Teddy, thank you. Hey, uh, I still have 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this is the right one. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, to continue my presentation, um, all of us who's working with Mentari, we are, we've been in the off grid for a while in Indonesia. So the ambition from the beginning is we need to improve the approach. Um, we know that there are limitations with the technology, there are limitations with the capability of the local community. There are capability. Uh, they are also limited uh, uh, in, in in regard to the finance, etc. Um, not surprised because uh, the questions always in our mind is why we, uh, through government funding, have successfully built more than 700 mini grids, but uh, we still have the challenge with the business model. And uh, frankly, a lot of uh, these mini grids are now abandoned or not being productive. Um, we also know that uh, building a mini grid, 100% uh, uh, relying on renewable energy and battery storage, definitely have issues with energy management, um, and that's require some behavior engineer engineering with the community to ensure that people understand that renewable energy, especially with solar PV, only abundant during the day, so they need to switch the behavior on using this uh, abundant energy for productive use during the day. And that also means you cannot cook rice cooker, uh, the use rice cooker after 5 p.m., for example. Um, so we started the projects, luckily, uh, during COVID. So we take a slow pace. Um, we wanted to make sure that community is ready because that's the key ingredient in building a community uh, projects like this. And that means we uh, make sure that the community co-design this uh, uh, program and also have a say in the project implementation. Um, they also have to start discussing about the business model that they want to choose. They also have to provide a legal and also governance structure on place. And there is an opportunity in Indonesia with the uh, new um, legal establishment now called uh, village level social, uh, enterprise or Bundes. And they are likely enough also able to get a capital participation through uh, village fund. This is an opportunity that we want to uh, tap into it. So yeah, the project is, has to be go beyond energy access. Uh, the quality it has to be 24 hours. We must provide o &M service through the contract. Uh, because we know that it takes time for local community to transfer the knowledge, especially post-installation knowledge. Um, three years, it's a guarantee for us uh, as a project owner to be able, with the certain KPI for the EPC to transfer the knowledge to the community. 
And also we, we train the youth to be prepared um, to have a skill on ONM uh, solar PV, and it's certified to Indonesian standard that has benchmarked with uh, WTO. We also want to promote women leader uh, lead entrepreneurship to two uh, productive use of energy methodology. The first one is the productive use of energy at the house level. And then through the second one is through the anchor load that we provided to the projects. Next. Um, yeah, next, please. Yeah. So um, by doing this, we also extend our um, uh, learning to have a proper mapping. We call it is incentivizing demand load through productive use of energy, basically looking at the existing resources in the community. Um, and then looking at the market, whether these communities has values and in need of uh, value added intervention. We um, have documented this in this um, document, feasibility study for PUE. Uh, we work, we met the uh, social enterprise that exists in Indonesia who are willing to become the offtaker with the Bumdes. So in this sense, the Bumdes that we uh, intervene is actually a startup. Um, so the idea is to engage the offtaker early on to make sure that the production for the plant, plant uh, planting through the post uh, harvest and processing follows the industry standard uh, in order to get the order or purchase order from them directly. So we have map up specific for this village next. Uh, there are few uh, community that has values, especially to support tourism and also emerging um, food industry for um, tourism and uh, especially in the near mar nearby market in Java or Bali. And they are nutmeg, and also, sorry, not nutmeg, uh, candle nut, uh, ginger, turmeric, and also citronella oil for, um, what is it, uh, the perfume for the, for the room. Next. Yeah, so from all the mapping, we also learned that um, apart from uh, this uh, intervention, we use extensive energy during the day. Um, they are also mostly done by women. So um, uh, we work closely. We also separate from this, we also introduce gender and inclusion intervention uh, to make sure that women also take the opportunity, especially also uh, girls, to take opportunity to benefit from the productive use that we introduce. Um, the only um, thing that we're still not working on is on the production of wood products because mostly male are interested in operating this. We only have two women who are very um, into the wood production. Um, so this is uh, the reality in the maturity at the moment. Next. Yeah, so I think this is, uh, the, the, the beginning of the projects, we also uh, designed the, the solar system to have 50% 50, 50 oversized solar panel to enable us to harvest a reserve energy. And that's account for about 70,000 kilowatt hour per year, uh, which is allocate, we allocated 16% of the uh, reserve energy for productive use uh, and some uh, reserve for uh, increase in the demand. Next. Next, please. Yeah. So apart from that target, we um, also, uh, the, the idea is to build the workstation uh, close to the solar PV uh, site to be able to be controlled um, because uh, sometimes the, the community uh, work do also during the night. We also realize that most of the people will be on their field during the day and some people might be come back after 5 p.m. and running this productive review. So we need to closely monitor these uh, activities uh, in order to maximize the lifetime of the battery as well during the night. Um, this is the project to solar PV interconnected to each other into uh, in four hamlets. Um, and in, within the total of install capacity around 95 kilowatt bit. Next. Um, I think I already explained this a little bit before. Um, we uh, also document uh, a lot of our uh, knowledge in our website, including introduce the Boomdes renewable energy. And now it has uh, been we already have received some interest from the government to learn from these projects. 
um, for activating their uh, projects in Minigrid. Next. Yeah, so this is the overall uh, strategy. Uh, I mentioned before the Boomdesk also receive capital um, participation to uh, village. The village in Indonesia, each of them receive approximately about 100,000 US per year, and they can use that for um, capital participation in Boomdesk. Um, now this Boomdesk will have to uh, business village electricity service unit, which we know it's, it's not gonna pay for itself. So we uh, focus more on agribusiness agri unit. And then we also have received two uh, um, off checker from social enter enterprise in Java. Uh, they are well known in Indonesia and have a big market cap in Indonesia as well, supporting the uh, uh, farmers in Indonesia. Next. Um, yeah, this is just the numbers, but it also means that um, it comes with challenge. Um, uh, we know that uh, productive use of energy have a potential to contribute to the uh, economical of the solar PV and also with uh, local development, local economic development, which is inclusive, of course, and uh, promoting uh, youth participation. Um, but the challenge when you work with the community is, I think there are two prominent challenges that I learned so far. This is a four years project. The first one is this typical community. They do not work um, uh, effectively on anything that uh, requires collective action. So when we come and we pro uh, introduce productive use energy, energy, we were thinking about uh, 10 hectare, hectare of productive use of energy through ginger, et cetera, et cetera, but it's not working. So we switch in the middle to more of promoting smallholder um, farmer. And then the second one will be, um, because we're working at the village level, uh, business skills are very rare in these communities. So we have to employ a lot of strategies on place, such as uh, internship, uh, with the off takers, we need we do uh, trainings with local uh, vocational schools to make them uh, prepare and ready to take the business skills. Um, those are my presentation. I think times. Well, thank you very much, and we can continue on the discussion. Okay, so. Um... So let's move on to the panel discussions. And uh, uh, so the speakers that come through their presence. We have been over half an hour. So we have a variety of questions, and uh, how many we have? And uh, from app, yes, many questions. So before we make any questions, uh, um, I I made some question for you. So I guess let's do that and uh, uh, give us a few minutes. And uh, so um, my first questions, you know. How can we achieve our goal of these uh, decarbonized society, especially in the Asian Pacific regions? What kind of innovative business model and financial mechanism should be prepared for that? So um, um, normally I ask you know, the speakers and uh, the questions, but uh, before doing that, so I want to do something new. And can you turn this? I asked the hottest and smart guy who's popular, uh, Popularity has skyrocketed recently. So who's that? Oh, you can see that? So, chat GPT. So I ask in the same question to chat GPT. Uh, uh, so it come out in a second, you know, uh, of one uh, achieving a de uh, decarbonized society in the Asian Pacific region required a comprehensive multi-phase approach involving a various stakeholders, including government, business communities, and uh, here's some strategy, blah, blah, blah. So uh, one, in a transition to renewable energy. So two, uh, energy efficiency and conversations, uh, uh, conservations. And the three, in uh, electrification and transportation. And four, is, uh, sustainable urban development. Uh, can you go next? Oh, can you go next, please? 
Yes, and uh, Secure Economy and Green Finance and Investments, Collaboration and Knowledge Sharing. Oh, so that, that came as an instance. So uh, can you go next? So uh, there, they, the chat GPT, uh, chat GPT and it provide eight question, uh, the answers. So, so I'd like to pass on to you the how, how, how do you see the statements? And uh, do you have any other way? So go, starting from ever. It's a bit unique way. It's a, I adapt to new things all the time, so. Um, a chat GPT is, is learning a lot and it's learning every day and clearly is tapping into a lot of uh, information. That being said, it's relatively high level and uh, I think um, uh, we're not out of business by doing our day-to-day -day jobs and delivering on the ground uh, the changes that we need to decarbonize uh, energy. Uh, that being said, um, you know, we, the overview of the eight um, areas where to focus on is spot on. Um, it is absolutely critical that we engage in all of these um, elements of the sectors, and it's absolutely critical that we uh, provide uh, private sector solutions to uh, decarbonization. Um, you know, one of the hats that I wear is the private financing advisory network. Uh, the business that we are in is to provide project preparation uh, services um, to develop bankable pipeline of projects for investors. And we operate in um, all of the areas where Chet GPT has outlined to um, as, as critical for decarbonizing Asia. Um, do we have challenges? Of course. Um, our colleague Farhan has told us very clearly earlier that uh, not enough investment is going into uh, climate change yet. Not enough investment is going into decentralized renewable energy um, solutions, but it is absolutely moving into the right direction and we are working uh, in the right pace to achieve that. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll pass on to the foreign, uh, foreign if you have comment. Thanks, Doc. Um, yeah, interesting and uh, comprehensive answer, I'd say. You know, at IRENA, we're sort of in the business of laying out decarbonization pathways. We have this uh, annual publication called the World Energy Transitions Outlook that looks at a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And I've been throwing a lot of uh, numbers and figures out there. I hope you don't mind if I share one more. Um, so the first three points on renewable energy, um, not just in the power sector, but also in other end uses, such as heating, mm -hmm. um, energy efficiency and conservation, and electrification of transportation as, as well as heating. Um, we estimate that uh, these three categories alone can address 70% of the carbon emission abatement that is needed by 2050. Uh, what's perhaps maybe not in this answer is that the rest of the 30% uh, will come from the very hard to abate sectors. And there you need other technological avenues such as um, renewable hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. So just to add to that answer, oh. but I'll go back to the financing bit um, again, that uh, in developing countries, especially where there's a growing energy demand, uh, you need uh, affordable access to financing uh, because the energy transition is, it has a high capex requirement. And so if countries don't have access to uh, sufficient and affordable financing, they may be locked into uh, fossil fuels, which is which has a more of a pay pay as you go um, approach. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, thank you so much, Jenna. Uh, yes, and uh, um, um, I guess I'm uh, moving to the next questions and a uh, question two. Uh, can we chase in uh, a two rabbit uh, with decarbonization and profit improvement? So, uh, before we're asking uh, the chat GPT, you know, why don't we go for it? Uh, uh, Sonita. Okay, thank you. I'll try to answer that. Maybe I'm not as smart as chat GPT, but I'll try. <laughs> okay, I think it's it's possible uh, from my perspective to like chase the two rabbits of decarbonization and the profit improvement at the same time. If you're looking at the business um, perspective, like transitioning into clean energy, adopting like rooftop solar, uh, energy efficiency is going to help the business a lot in terms of saving their costs, as well as um, attracting the like 
financing, impact investments, as as well as the support from the public who are like in their like supporting in the sustainability sectors. So I would say um, this is sorry. You did a great answer already. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, let, let's see what the chat, chat GPT said. Oh, that's also instant, and it, it, uh, it's provided eight answers. So, uh, cost cutting measures, innovative investment, clean tech. I don't read it. So, in, in, in identify a reno, reno, uh, new revenue streams, embrace, embrace in a sustainable supply chain, and can go next. Uh, gain competitive advantage and a long-term risk mitigation, collaboration knowledge, and allowing a sustainability framework. Oh, it's a lot of stuff. And uh, so allowing a sustainability goal with a business objective and an uh, organization can effectively pursue a boss and a decarbonizing and a profit improvement. So we both agree on that. So oh, um, you see, you know, chat GPT seems to be very smart. So I ask in a second, uh, third questions. Can go. Can we take over my moderator roles? So what is it? Can go next. Can go next. Yeah. Yeah. He admit that he or she admit that I don't have ability to direct the takeover and perform a task in a moderator role. So thank you very much. My position is secure, so uh, I carry on then. Thank you. And uh, why don't we go next? So last questions I ask. Can you go next? I think in one more question. I, I... Is there one more question? Can you go next, if you don't mind? <laughs> okay. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh, oh. What can we do promote the decarbonization in our lifetime? So, um, shall I go with a chapter GPT or and uh, you go first or whichever? Which one do you like? Pretty. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Daddy or pretty. Uh, okay. I think the there are two level. Uh, personally, um. I, I always want to do more on offsetting my carbon to natur nature-based um, projects. Um, but also for uh, speaking of from the village development uh, point of view is to um, to have more, uh, introduce more modern appliance for mm -hmm. rural community because this is something that hasn't been reached by them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pretty, if you have comment. Uh, yeah, so in addition to it, so how we can promote decarbonization is by, uh, first of all, changing our day-to-day -day habits in which we can reduce our emissions, maybe uh, reduction in, say, the electricity consumption and all, what kind of vehicles we are taking. So one could be a lifestyle change that one can do. Apart from that, since most of us are uh, working in the energy sector, I think uh, uh, what how we can uh, do the change is drive conversations onto it. If somebody is in the policy sector, they can... Uh, talk more on the side of, say, decarbonization, uh, whether into the central grid or in the off-grid uh, technologies. So uh, it depends on both the lifestyle as well as on our uh, work that we are doing. And uh, through our work, we are also working on various implementations uh, in which we are kind of enabling the transition of small health centers into DRE-powered health, center, health centers so that they can have 24 into 7 access to electricity and also some of our work we are currently studying in the livelihood sector, which I already showed. So sure. yeah, so both both ways we can do. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, what did, uh, just, in a, uh, just for reference to so take a look at it and what they said. So uh, reducing energy consumption and transition renewable energy to electrify your transportation support sustainable practice. Next. And... Uh, Advocate for change and invest in green technologies and engage in local initiative, stay informed and educate others and support the carbon offset and project and, uh, and the vote uh, for climate and conscious leaders. 
So anyway, so so I highlight in uh, red, uh, yellow is uh, remember it's a collective effort of individual can drive a significant change. By taking this step and encourage others to join you and you can play an active role in promoting and decarbonization in your lifetime. So I think you know, uh, the chat GPT tells you know, what, what, uh, what, he, uh, what, what uh, the, they can think, uh, but uh, we, we as a human being has an, uh, then, uh, we as a professional uh, taken uh, expertise in uh, live experience. That's something that we can bring on the table and that's something we can change that. So we uh, can drive significant change. That's what I think. So um, uh, anyway, so uh, just then uh, uh, we did some uh, exercise. So let's move on to the, uh, the uh, live question Q&A sessions. So uh, if you have an, any Q&A uh, uh, questions uh, uh, from floor and uh, please go to the table, I mean, the mic and uh, so. Anybody, any questions? We have uh, 12 minutes. So if you don't have it, then uh, I have you know, many questions on the app so I can do that. Okay, so, oh, okay. I have a question starting from one. Uh, can we use a solar panel as a colloquial? How will that work? Any innovative way to check the credit worthiness of potential users? So anyone can uh, answer that? So, yeah. Is this an answer? Is this a question sent from us to us? <laughs> okay so okay can can we use solar panel as a collateral of course collateral and how will that works and oh, of course yes but uh, any innovative way to check the creative worsening for potential users so uh anybody can answer then uh thanks Thanks, Eva. Sure. Um, clearly, it depends on the local um, conditions of the financial institutions and the investors that uh, you're uh, getting your project funded through. Uh, in many instances, the um, assets themselves can be used as uh, collateral. However, what we would really like to see is the revenue coming from generating uh, power through the solar, solar panels as being able to be used uh, in the financing of the projects. And that is in many uh, countries uh, across the world still not possible due to the regulations uh, in those countries. This is something that um, you know we would like to see happening a lot more. Uh, many of the developed countries are doing this. Uh, they use the future revenue as a uh, form of uh, financing the project, but uh, developing countries do not have the regulatory um, basis to to be able to do this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. So uh, I have a question to uh, Brian. Uh, is there any analysis how much of financing goes to actual infrastructure and uh, how much goes to sustainability, straining community capacity to manage RE and a supporting likelihood? Can you answer that? Okay. Is there an analysis how much of financing goes to the actual infrastructure and how much goes to sustainability? Okay. Um, so the figures that I presented earlier, that's uh, investment going to renewable energy projects. Um, so utility scale, mainly utility scale uh, power plants. Uh, so every dollar that's, that's being shown here, um, is resulting in some uh, megawatt uh, deployment of some megawatt of capacity. Um, it doesn't include investments in other broader infrastructures such as transmission lines, et cetera. Um, but we do, if you have a look at the report, we do have some figures on um, investments outside the renewable energy sector to, to um, power and transmission lines, to grid flexibility, uh, but also on the electric, um, electric vehicle side, 
um, on charging infrastructure, uh, on green hydrogen electrolyzers. So because the main uh, sort of what we're trying to track here is energy transition rel related investments. Uh, so these are some of the categories that we're able to um, uh, capture. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, there is investment going into the small scale grassroots uh, decentralized energy solutions and um, uh, you know, rural uh, solutions, et cetera. Um, we at REAP, we are working on a um, couple of uh, programs, including um, in, in the Sub-Saharan African region, uh, there is investment going into these solutions. And in PFAN, you know, we see about 500 projects coming through our door on an annual basis. Um, and most of these projects are fairly small scale. Uh, the um, average investment or ticket size of our projects that we support is about $3 million. Okay, so we do see small scale successful businesses and projects in these markets and they do very well. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I have a few more questions and uh, still in the queue. So uh, to Pretty. Uh, paper reuse model, uh, who paid the upfront cost of machinery equipment on behalf of the users? Thanks for the question. So what we have observed that uh, there are a lot of uh, new emerging innovators that have come into the market who are kind of providing these uh, solution, whether it's a solar powered irrigation pumps, cold storages or agro processing mills. Uh, they are the ones who are kind of funding it and they source the fund from either uh, grant based funding or some uh, competitive startups are basically raising the funds. So uh, the funding part of the upfront cost is kind of borne by the innovators. And they use this kind of paper use business model uh, so that they could uh, not only uh, run the system or generate revenue out of it, but also in the long run, once the payback period is over for these systems, they can generate additional uh, amount of money, which could go towards the initial upfront cost and also could be utilized toward the maintenance and operation of these systems. So whatever we have observed, these are mostly philanthropically uh, backed uh, in innovations. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have a uh, very interesting question. So if solar station for 10,000 people is being built, how many years will the company cover their costs? So it's kind of... <laughs> yeah. Any answer? It's... No answers. <laughs> okay, let's... Sure, sure, go ahead. It goes to the floor then. So um, my name is Peter Dupont. I'm with um, Asia Clean Energy Forum and Asia Clean Energy Partners and PFEN. Uh, so I have a question for Deddy and Sonita and um, uh, Preeti. And um, so with these productive use of decentralized or the use of decentralized energy for sort of agro-processing and productive uses that you've all talked about in Indonesia, India, and Cambodia. Do you have any examples of the MFIs, the, multi, the microfinancing organizations getting involved? Because it seems like that would be, this session is about sort of innovative solutions. And I'm wondering if there's some good examples of MFIs taking this up and sort of having programmatic funding. Yeah, so um, maybe from my presentation, I talk um, a bit more about our acceleration program, but actually it's also under a project called Switch to Solar, which is uh, funded um, by EU Switch. So under this project, we get involved with the micro um, financial institutions as well. So in Cambodia, mostly um, micro financial institutions, they have their, the product, which is um, like agriculture uh, loan products. But it's not um, specifically focused on like the adoption of um, solar technologies. And so far under the project, we have been working with them to raise awareness about the solar technology and working with them to see if uh, there's a possibility of a, like designing a new uh, financial packages for the farmers that would like to purchase solar technology. But so far, I would say it's very in a pretty early stage because uh, most of them still find it 
it's still a small market, so they don't necessarily need to design a specific product for that. Because I would say like, if they focus on a bigger scope like agriculture loans, they would have more um, customers, but if for solar, they, yeah, it's considerably small. And I would say they still thinking of the risk um, as well of like um, providing that, that loan package. So yeah, I would say it's very in an early stage in Cambodia, we still like advocating, providing uh, them the knowledge about um, like doing the piloting with them as well in different financial um, packages. Thank you. Really? Yeah, so for uh, what we have observed is that mostly uh, for the microfinance uh, institutions, they mostly uh, provide uh, towards seeds or the other agricultural equipments rather than just the PUE products. So, uh, so majorly it has been towards the seed and the farm equipments and not towards the PUE. PUE. And uh, the, we saw a few of the instances where microfinance have kind of provided uh, such type of loans were for the solar rooftop rather than the PUE. So solar rooftop is something we have seen that uh, that have been kind of supported by MFIs. I think the experience in Indonesia, um, I, I, I believe there's no solar loan package for uh, small scale in Indonesia. Um, but uh, there are a lot of uh, credit or loan uh, scheme out there in Indonesia for developing the business itself, um, especially for loan for women who are doing a small small business. And this is something that we encourage uh, within our projects. Mm. Um, uh, of course, even if it's microfinance, they're still uh, reluctant to engage uh, women, for example, or uh, early on company uh, business like Boomdesk because it has risk. Um, and on the other occasion, other equation is the, the these people who want to have loan, they don't necessarily have a skill to write a business plan and something like that. So um, what we're trying to do is to encourage lots more loan to expand their uh, productive use of uh, business. Um, and then working with the off taker to uh, have more um, uh, access to their market. Something. Like that. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, do you have any, uh, if it's okay? Oh, so uh, one last question. So if you have a, a, anybody on our floor. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, Roby Halep with the Right Energy Partnership with Indigenous Peoples. The first question was actually my question. Um, Cause most of the financing that's being done on renewable energy is more on the deployment of the technology. Now the work, uh, for example, our experience in the right energy partnership, 10, per, 10 to 15% of the work is on the infrastructure installation and on. 85% of the work is on community strengthening and ensuring sustainability. So in terms of investment, I think it would be good to make an analysis, not just on financing on the actual technology itself, but also the full work that it entails to ensure sustainability of our projects. I think that would mean more a lot, especially for community-based um, renewable energy projects. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a very valid point. Um, if you haven't... Uh attract any investments beyond uh, these uh, power plants uh, when it comes to renewable energy and, and the decentralized renewable space, of course. Uh, but what we've done um, and we're doing uh, at the moment is uh, tracking the socioeconomic benefits uh, that come from uh, deploying this technology, uh, whether uh, it's in terms of uh, jobs or, or uh, incremental growth in GDP. Uh, so that's available um, in our reports. But Again, these are macro level analysis and some of those uh, fine details that how are indigenous communities being affected, um, how are the communities uh, you know, impacted by these projects uh, and what are some of the investments going to community uh, based projects as well. Those finer details of course can get a bit uh, lost in these macro, macro level trends. Um, but yeah, that's a point well taken and uh, we'll of course try to uh, track those as well uh, to the best of our ability. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. So I so uh, thank you so much and I appreciate the speaker and uh, uh, please give an, a round of applause.
uh, one uh, housekeeping uh, note. Uh, uh, we have an, a character reception at six at the right hand side corners. And so uh, there is a cafeteria. So starting from six, so we have half an hour. So thank you so much.